I don't even know what to say about this. This year has been the biggest struggle any year hunting all of us have ever experienced. Every time we do something, it fails miserably. Oh God, thank you Lord. Serious snow. Right, so we walked our butts all the way up here while we rode all night. We came up here and it was just pouring snow and we could not see anything in this basin. And so I I stopped here. I'm just like, I know there's elk here. I'm just gonna sit down and wait till it clears. We just sit down, I pulled out my jet boy, I was gonna have some coffee. And I look through the snow and I could see a bull standing on the other side, and there was eight bulls right here. They're still over here. But there's nothing else. So we're gonna push up. This is really good. We're just we're missing the herd somewhere. So we're just gonna keep working these draws until we find them. But man, it's miserable out here. Like build a fire. It's just snowing on you. You're wet. Hard to go. Hopefully this doesn't push the elk out of here because we're way in here. If these elk pull down, we have to go out and around. It's gonna take us two days to get back in position. We'll see. Now. I won't say Justin jinxed us, but the elk did exactly what we didn't want them to do. The heavy wet snow pushed them out of the high country. We hiked 10 miles that day looking for a good bull and turned up a couple of smaller bulls, but nothing Justin was hoping to take. We found ourselves in knee deep snow, soaking wet, extremely tired, and then we were welcomed back by the horses to a collapsed tent and wet sleeping bags. To top it off, the tent pole snapped in my face and about broke my nose. Oh, yeah, we got a mess. I'd be a liar if I didn't say that there's times where I question our sanity. But we do have a bit of fun, even when we're suffering. What we didn't realize, though, is that the suffering had only just begun. Um, it is so humid. Look at this hole. That's... Look how humid it is in here. Look at our bags. Just... The snow kept coming down and ended up sealing the rain fly of the tent, completely cutting off our air supply. We woke up gasping for air and soaking wet. This ended up being a major learning lesson for us and a good warning for others to ventilate your tent properly at all times. Then we broke camp and cut our way back out of the drainage through the cold snow. We had officially lost our first two days.
Adam and Matt had met a similar fate on their side of the mountain, as Justin and I did the first two days. By the time we met up on the evening of day two, it was too late to go anywhere. Day three of season found us reunited and heading into another drink. 17 miles to be exact. The problem was, when we got there, the elk were leaving. The snow had caught people and animals alike by surprise, and they were seeking lower elevations where the browse wasn't buried. So just as soon as we got where we wanted to camp, we turned around and headed back out, hoping for a chance at a bowl before dark. What's happening right now is that we spotted a herd moving down off the ridge and we're making an effort to get to them before they cross the bottom. So we don't have our packs and we're just going as fast as we can go to try to intercept the herd. We got about 20 minutes of light left, so we'll see how it goes. Despite our best efforts, we still failed. We couldn't catch up to the elk before nightfall. Every single attempt we made had fallen short, and so we pressed on into the next day and a new location once again. This is our third relocation in the first four days of the season. And we got this just massive dump of snow and now everything's shifted. And so we pulled way into this spot where we think that they're gonna pull to, we don't know. But we've got some fresh elk tracks from this morning so we're gonna work it. We got a handful of days here. We're hoping we can pull something together. We've let go a bull at 1,050 because I just feel like that's totally unethical. I know the gun can shoot it, but anything can go wrong at that range. But he was nice, he's probably 300, 310. I let him go. We'll see what happens. I think it's gonna be good. There's mule deer tracks everywhere. I love mule deer. Oh, I see him now, yep. We got a bunch of elk. I've sitting here drinking coffee. And the one spot I couldn't see on this whole hillside, I moved around and looked down and there's elk everywhere. And I think I saw a big yellow body in the timber. So we're gonna try and position ourselves. Man, your perspective is so important. Like sometimes you just need to step over to the side, and take a little different look. You go through life just tunnel vision, going one direction. It's like, oh, this is what I see, this is what I'm doing. Sometimes if you step out of that for a second, and look at it from a different perspective, it changes everything. All of a sudden, there's help right there.
know what it is yet? No. I just barely can see it. So we've counted 20 elk down in this basin, and it's really timbered, and there's tracks everywhere. So we're believing there's more, and we can see what we believe is a big, mature bull body, totally different color than all the rest, and double the size of the cows that are around him in the aspen, but we can't see his head. So I don't hardly believe in long-range shooting. So we're gonna, we have 600 yard shot here. We're gonna wiggle down to 200. That way when he stands up, we know he's dead. I don't like guessing. Pretty good bull tracks here. Yeah. Look at them. They're just walking through this. You'd never even see them. No. They hang out right underneath the clouds. Probably more in here than we really Justin and I had managed to close this distance way down and got in close on these elk. Eventually they got up and fed away and we watched them a little bit longer before finally spotting the bull that we had been looking for. It turned out to just be a five point, so we let him go and headed back up the mountain to meet up with Matt and Adam to see what they had found. down in the bottom here and we are moving a little closer looks like a pretty decent bull but we're gonna get in closer and uh, check him out while Matt and Adam were heading down the ridge to get into shooting position Justin and I headed down another ridge in case this bull tried to slip out the drainage out from underneath them Whenever you're ready. I think we have time, so hold on. There's cows right behind you.
We've seen some crazy things in our time. For some reason, these elk decided to run towards the shot. And it worked out really well for Adam to miss this bull due to an improper range. Missed. He's running back. They're running back. I don't have him. Got him. Got him. Even though this is a crazy experience and completely out of the ordinary, there's one thing that we do know. If a bull's walking towards you, you wait until he's right underneath you. There's no point taking a longer shot than you absolutely have to. And Adam and Matt waited this bull out perfectly. Got the big one, but we got elk in this field. Go ahead. I got him. Center screen. He's behind that bush. Got him. Did you? Get him again. Ew! 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 Got him! Dumped him! I got him, dude. Were you on him? Yep. I Pre got him. That's a good ball. <sighs> Worked out. We got him. Yes. Thanks, Matt. Dude, that's a stud ball. Is it? Yeah. Got him. Did you? Get him again. Check this out. Look at this. I'm walking along and I look and it's like, it's a weird looking stump. I think it's actually pretty fresh. It is. I did not expect that. I guess we should have from the size of the bases. <laughs> I did when I saw the bases. Oh my goodness. Please tell me the other side's right there. Oh, we're gonna find it. I think it's right here. No way. What a tank. Dude, no. Okay, hey, you're not gonna believe this. You get to keep them in Colorado. Nuh -uh. Yes. Are you sure? I am a hundred percent sure. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> what in the world? That's what's up. We need a picture of this. We have had just a great evening. It's been four hard days. And then Adam just shot a really nice six point bull. And then like we're just walking up the hill in deep snow. I find this thing. It's interesting how we chase after these things like elk and these big trophies and stuff our whole life. And we want them so bad. And there's this show. He might judge me for watching it, but it was 1883. And in this show, Elsa is kind of the main character girl. She has this line. It's about their journey out west in the like Oregon Trail kind of stuff. And she says, how she loves the land, but she makes this comment. She says, no matter how much you love the land, it'll never love you back. And I've been thinking nonstop about that with idols. Like when you hear the word idol, it's kind of a religious term, but an idol is anything that you just like worship. You would give anything for you, like everything you can do to get a hold of it. And you just love it with everything that you have. And the thing is with everything, like the sheep, that elk, whatever, the biggest deer you've ever killed, or the biggest bass you ever caught or turkey you ever shot, it doesn't matter, like they're all idols and no matter how much you love them, they will never love you back. And there ain't nothing wrong with hunting and chasing after God's creation, but God can love you back. And when you chase him, oh man, it is the most.
way better than any elk or sheep or anything you could ever chase. We're told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's not because God's some kind of dictator and we have to do it. That's because, man, when we are loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, everything falls into order. When you put the first thing, when you put that first, that, that key, that piece of the puzzle, it's like perfect. You put that in place. You put God as the priority. Everything else just falls into place. And every time you just start chasing after things and idolizing things and loving things that can't love you back, dude, it's just miserable. You'd give anything for them and they don't even care if you own them or somebody else owns them. It is awesome up here, but the reality is, is that the only thing cooler than the cool things that we chase is the cool God that created them. And we run from him. We've been running from him our whole life. And it's time to run towards him. If you think this is cool, my God made that. And he's way cooler. And he's got life and life abundantly. That's what Jesus promises. I know I beat it into the dirt. But if you've been running from God, I want to challenge you today. If you've been loving things that don't love you back. If you've been, if you've been putting your family on the back burner. If you've been putting God on the back burner for things that don't love you back. You need to churn. And you need to chase after God right now. Put him in line. Put your family in line. Get everything in line. And enjoy these beautiful days that God gives you. If he gives them to you. Because, man, it's awesome. And this is awesome. But I know it'll never love me back. But I'm going to enjoy it while I'm here. And then I'm going to enjoy God for eternity. If you want to learn more about following God and living the life that we're living, go over to our website, www.limitlesshunting.com. We have a resource that we wrote over there called The First Mile. It is, we, we just wrote it to help you figure out how to actually practically walk with God in a way that is totally tangible and changes your life. Go over there, it's absolutely free. We don't get anything from it, we give it away free. We want you to learn and grow and live the life that God created you for. You have a purpose, a destiny with God. And if you think these are cool, God's got way more for us in the future. We hope you all enjoyed this video as much as we enjoyed making it. And we'll see you again next time in God's Limitless Outdoors.